I'm Lamar Arayman, Kuwait's National Point of Contact for the Space Generation Advisory Council. And on behalf of the organizing team, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to each and everyone in this room. As the year that marks the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing bestows itself upon us, it brings along with it new opportunities for Kuwait's youth to reach for space and grab the stars, to break free from Earth's atmosphere and to touch the surface of our enchanting neighbor, the moon our gateway to deep space, and our next big endeavor. We are going to kick off our evening with a short video from last year's Space Generation. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the evening. My name is Lamal Araiman. I'm a second year mechanical engineering student in the American University of the Middle East. I'm a member of Space Crew team along with Ghadir Baqar. And in our proposal, we discuss a conceptual design to build an SASL here in Kuwait, which is short for Space Environment Simulation Laboratory. The SASL is an industrial test facility that provides near vacuum experience and thermal radiation that we encounter in outer space. In the chambers of our, lab our laboratory, spacecrafts go through various examinations to test their capability to survive radiation, low atmospheric pressure levels, and low temperature pre-launch. The laboratory is going to be placed in Rub al Khali due to the dune and climate similarity between the latter and Mars. This project is going to be the first Kuwaiti space simulation laboratory. This industrial, uh, as Lama said, it is an industrial test facility, so it will be used for receiving spacecraft internationally to put them under the test of human and spacecraft endurance against the effects of various space environments. This will add value for Kuwait by improving the industrial and scientific fields. السلام عليكم اسمي جابر القلاف ومعاي محمد صراف احنا طلبة بالجامعة الامريكية بالشرق الاوسط تخصصنا الهندسة الكهربائية وموضوعنا اليوم اسمه قمرنا كويتي الفكرة تبدأ باطلاق القمر الصناعي الكويتي في الفضاء الخارجي يدور حول الارض يهدف هذا المقترح الى دراسة البدائل المتاحة في مجال الاستشعار عن بعد بحيث تخدم هذه البدائل المتطلبات الكويت بالدرجة الاولى والمنطقة المحيطة اختيار نوع القمر الصناعي سوف يتطلب بحث لأنواع الأقمار الصناعية المتوفرة حول العالم من حيث مداها البصري والتطبيقات التي تغطيها هذا القمر سوف يساعد الكويت على التوقف عن دفع أي مبالغ مادية لشراء نتاج تريد رؤيتها من الأقمار الصناعية الأخرى وأيضا قد يستفاد منها في بيع المعلومات لدول مجاورة من خلال المعلومات التي تستقبلها وسيقدم المقترح أيضا الأهم الأسس التي ستقوم عليها دراسة جدوى الفائدة ليست فقط مادية ستكون أيضا علميا لتطور جيل جديد على بناء أقمار صناعية أخرى لأن الأقمار الصناعية متشابهة تقريبا فإذا تم بناء واحد سيتم بناء غيره بسهولة Hi, my name is Ali al -Awadhi. My team name is called Space Bar because we are separated by a distance. Our idea is to colonize Mars and we will start everything in Kuwait. We are going to make our own habitat and study the critical factors on Mars that enable us to create a settlement there. And then we are going to Elon Musk before 2024 to show him what we have and help him with his project. This is Nasser Ashkanani. And along with his colleague, Hamad al-Hindi, uh, they aim to launch a rocket to an altitude of about 100 kilometers with a payload of about 45 kilograms. This is Hassan al-Shirazi, and he thinks that establishing a space agency in Kuwait is mandatory to lead the space research in the country. The team consists of Hassan al-Shirazi and Ibrahim Mendani. In their proposal, they want to discuss the strategy and the establishment of a local space agency. An abscess extraction is a simple procedure on Earth, but on space the procedure can be so complicated. This team consists of Sena and Anastasia. They aim to review and suggest multiple ideas to create an effective surgical environment in space.
And now an opening remark will be delivered by our very own engineer Ghanem Latebi, who is tonight's event manager, and he's also the regional coordinator of the Middle East in the Space Generation Advisory Council. So please welcome Ghanem. I am very delighted. Thank you for very much for your uh, attendance. Uh, that video was last year, and you probably noticed one of the participants is currently working with me in this project. Um, I am very happy that we are forming a team now, kind of a space movement. Uh, first, I would like to ask to, to thank uh, the, the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Science, Dr. Leila Al Musawi, for <coughs> making this. Ha uh, this workshop happen. I would like to thank our speakers and mentors, Mr. John, uh, Professor Oleg, and Mr. Shaitania, as well as our judges, uh, who who made also some sort of mentoring, and they judged the, the, the participants for today's and yesterday's event, uh, Mr. Abdulaziz Larayev and Mr. Abdul Wahab Zaidan. I will, I will take 10 minutes. I will be talking about uh, the moon village for emerging space countries. I have X in brackets because this is uh, an international initi initiative that is starting from Kuwait. So I'm going to, to speak specifically about Kuwait. So the moon village for emerging space countries, this virgin this year in Kuwait. I will start with our beliefs. Um, our beliefs are actually the motivation for uh, organizing this workshop, the Moon Village uh, participation of emerging space countries. Um, because this is a single project, two days project, the outer space team in Kuwait is a voluntary uh, team that was registered under the uh, Ministry of uh, Social Affairs. This will be the, the continuation of the project. So, the world is progressing very fast toward a base in the, lunar, in the lunar surface. Deep in the space community, uh, the moon topic is a raising star. Um, I am pretty sure that our participants now share the same belief with me because during the workshop, we discovered that, that there are tremendous opportunities for everyone in the moon. And this is no longer a science fiction. Going to the moon, you will see now from our discussion with the moderators, going to the moon is no longer a science fiction. Um, the associated activity going to the moon can open tremendous opportunities for everyone, including Kuwait. And by everyone here, I don't only mean different countries, but also entities, profit organization, non-profit organization, uh, different individuals from different backgrounds, not only engineers and scientists, also business uh, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, lawyers, everyone, like literally everyone. So this is our beliefs. How Kuwait can be part of the global efforts to colonize the moon? This is the main question we addressed during this event and our participants, every, our three teams, everyone has a different answer to this question. I believe in a teamwork. That's why we created this workshop, to answer this question, how to involve Kuwait in a moon village. And this, this is done by brainstorming uh, students and young professionals who are enthusiastic about space. So it's a, it's a workshop, of course. Uh, it's a two-day workshop, but it's more than that. It's a space movement, and we have several uh, objectives like raising local awareness about the value of a lo lunar exploration and communicate the youth voice from an end space faring country to the committee of peaceful use of outer space. Space is regulated by international law. Um, and the United Nations, there are uh, committees under the United Nations act like the, the body organizing uh, space policy. And one of them is uh, uh, the committee of peaceful use of outer space. We want to talk to the committee of, outer, uh, of this committee so we can talk to the world and to decision makers in Kuwait as well. Again, thank you for our sponsors and partners. KFAS has sponsored the event. We are very happy. Uh, this event 
would never happen without the support of KFAS. Our partner, the Moon Village Association, Mr. John Mankins, Mr. Professor Oleg, also from the Moon Village Association, they provided mentorship. So, the first day of the workshop was a round table brainstorming ideas for recommendations. We want to go to the United Nations and speak about our recommendation. This is representing the voice of Kuwait, which we had, I think, seven recommendations, seven different recommendations. Today, which is the second day, we will have the competition. So we will have three teams. I can see how stressful they are now. They will present about their ideas. And one winning team will win a trip to attend the Space Generation Congress and the International Astronautical Congress. Those, the, they are two big, con they are one of the biggest, I mean, uh, the biggest two conferences in space. Outer Space Team is going to be the continuation of this project. We will be having different working groups, maybe based on the ideas we will listen today, and we will, we will try to have uh, 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 the ideas implemented in the future. And everyone under, I mean, everyone is welcome to join the Outer Space Group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rana. Our first guest for the evening has been recognized as a leading expert in the field of space solar power. He is the founder and president of Mankins Technology and the vice president of the Moon Village Association. He was formerly chief technologist for NASA Human Exploration and Development of Space at NASA headquarters. Please help me welcome Mr. John C. Mankins. Good evening. It is a great pleasure to be here uh, uh, with you this evening. Uh, and I have to say that um, given this is my first time in Kuwait, uh, and it has been a tremendous pleasure. Uh, not, uh, not the 28 hours it took me to come from California, but that's uh, Lufthansa. Uh, but uh, the last two days spent with um, the young people who are the competitors this week uh, truly a, a great and wonderful experience. What I would like to discuss with you this evening uh, very briefly are the challenges and opportunities of the Moon Village. Uh, some uh, 56 years ago, uh, the U.S. had just undertaken the Apollo program, uh, and uh, in the summer of 1963, uh, Two scientists, uh, Homer Newell and Robert, uh, sorry, yeah, Homer Newell and Robert Gestro at uh, the then recently formed, only five years old, NASA headquarters, wrote a small essay, maybe uh, um, 15 pages, on why it was important uh, to land on the moon, to make this a goal of the United States. Uh, they published a small booklet. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get a copy from an uh, 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 older uh, professional at uh, NASA headquarters when I joined NASA in 1987, uh, NASA headquarters in 1987. Uh, he was in his uh, 80s at that time and had been working at NASA since the early 60s when he got his personal copy of this booklet. Uh, and as he got ready to retire, he shared it with me. Uh, it outlined key reasons which were then uh, communicated to uh, the U.S. Congress and stakeholders in the U.S. government uh, as to why it was critical. And these reasons included, of course, things like 
the space race, national security issues because of the competition uh, with the then uh, USSR, but also issues associated with uh, the discovery of fundamental knowledge, such as the origins of our solar system, the origins of the Earth itself, the early history of the solar system, all recorded in the impact craters of the lunar surface. And uh, also the opportunities inherent in new technologies that would have to be developed in order to make the moon landing a reality. Now we are coming up on the 60th anniversary this summer, uh, July 20th, of the moon landing. Uh, and the world is going back to the moon. Uh, and is going to the moon in tremendous numbers over the coming few years. And the question is, why? Why the moon? And the answer I would like to offer to you is that the moon is, a, is in fact a new world. It is a world to respect, a world to explore, and a world to utilize for the benefit of all people. The moon, in fact, represents a tremendous cultural heritage for humankind, not just the uh, footprint of uh, Neil Armstrong in the lunar dust, but also every mission, including those of the former Soviet Union, the Lunacods, and the new missions uh, which are now going, such as Shang E3 and Shang E4, which have recently been sent by China. Every single one of these is a stepping stone in the progress of humanity into space. And whereas many Earth orbiting spacecraft end up incinerated and dropping into the ocean. On the moon, everything will be preserved essentially unchanged for the history of our solar system for a billion years if we don't disturb it. And so all of this must be respected, not just as specific historical sites, but also the environment of the moon, which anyone, seven and a half billion people, can look up in the night sky and see the moon. And so it must be cared for, it must be respected. However, the big change since I was a young engineer, when everyone knew that the moon was dead, dry dust, uh, is that we now have discovered in the last 15 or 20 years that the moon is rich in volatile resources, essentially at the north and the south poles of the moon, in the permanently shadowed regions of the moon where it is extremely cold, only 30 or 40 or 50 degrees above absolute zero on the Kelvin scale, there are ices. And the existence of water ice at a location which is very convenient to the Earth, uh, water ice can of course be converted not just into water but also into oxygen for, for atmospheres and into rocket fuel, oxygen and hydrogen for transportation elsewhere, it fundamentally changes the economic equation for human activities not only in the inner solar system and around the Earth, but beyond. As a result, a wide variety of countries are now planning to go to the moon, uh, including, of course, China, which has been there recently, but also India, of course, Japan, uh, Canada, uh, South Korea, the European countries uh, included in the European Space Agency, uh, and recently the United States with a major new initiative. This moon rush, as it was called in a book some years ago by a good friend of mine, uh, uh, whose name is eluding me at this moment, but I'll think of it before I, I stop, uh, is made possible, it's driven not just by these resources, and it's made possible by a wide range of new technologies. This is not 1969 anymore. It doesn't require tens of billions of dollars to think about the moon. In fact, a variety of small companies are going to the moon with tens of millions of dollars. So costs that are well within the reach, not just of the many extraordinarily wealthy individuals, but essentially any country. And these technologies are far more like living ecosystems than they are like the, the giant monuments, uh, like the Saturn V rocket of 50 years ago, of 60 years ago. 
In addition, and made possible by the new technologies, there are enormous and very important new ventures that are starting. This is just uh, two examples. Uh, Blue Origin, uh, supported by uh, Jeff Bezos, and SpaceX, uh, whose uh, CEO is uh, Mr. Elon Musk. And the fundamental transformation which is being caused by these individuals, these new ventures, is completely changing the economics of access to space and the exploration of space. They are driving down the cost of launch to low Earth orbit, uh, not by a few percent, but, but by uh, multiple factors, uh, from uh, 15 or $20,000 per kilo to low Earth orbit to on the order of three or $4,000 per kilo. And with movement, uh, for example, with uh, the um, uh, heavy lift booster and what uh, he is now calling as a, the Starship, uh, SpaceX uh, and later Blue Origin are both working on fully reusable Earth to orbit transportation systems which might make the cost of getting into space less than $1,000 per kilo. And the difference between $20,000 a kilogram to low Earth orbit and $1,000 per kilogram to low Earth orbit is a market transformation. As a consequence, getting to the moon and exploring the moon and pursuing it becomes within, comes within reach of essentially anyone. And there are tremendous opportunities in the exploration and the understanding of the moon beyond the science that has already been done, including the search for, let's see if I can do this. I did it, haha. The search for new resources and their exploitation, the discovery of new science, uh, early human activities on the moon, uh, the search for um, uh, resources and the volatiles in the permanently shadowed regions, and eventually the establishment of large-scale operations on the moon. Uh, in addition, the moon is a location where we can demonstrate and understand how to operate in space, not just at the moon, but beyond, uh, both for the eventual settlement of the moon, but also for the exploration of places such as Mars or uh, the small bodies of the solar system. And the moon at these prices becomes a unique platform for the study of uh, our universe, including both optical astronomy and radio astronomy. And we all saw this week the tremendous power of networked radio astronomy with a baseline limited to the Earth in which we were able to get multi-pixel images of the event horizon of a massive, supermassive black hole for the first time, only imagined in physicists' uh, dreams and in uh, the cartoons uh, written by uh, Hollywood, and now imaged. But still, the press complains they're a little blurry, <laughs> those images. But if we had a baseline that was not limited to, to 10,000 kilometers or 20,000 kilometers by the size of the Earth, but in fact extended from the Earth and included a network of radio telescopes on the moon, it will be, uh, a, again, another revolution, not just supermassive, but in fact a wide range of, uh, of uh, black holes and similar astronomical uh, phenomenon in the universe. And going to the moon, because now it will be affordable, is uh, going to drive the development of new human space capabilities. Uh, both for uh, space stations, which could be located uh, both in the vicinity of the moon and elsewhere, and the development of capabilities uh, for human spaceflight. And another accomplishment or another uh, important event in science just this week, or might have been the end of last week, the release of the study results from Mark and Scott Kelly's uh, tremendous um, uh, team experiment between these two twins, uh, one of them who was on the International Space Station for a year, and one of them who was on the Earth, and now they've been compared, and I'm sure it was a very painstaking uh, set of uh, blood samples and MRI scans and tissue samples. I don't even want to know what they had to go through. Uh, but now there's a, a much greater understanding of what it means now to be in deep space for 12 months. Dry, the moon will be a driver for even better understanding and the development of new technologies to allow huma humanity to move into space. And eventually, the moon will be a place where humanity can settle. 
If you look at the poles of the moon, the north and the south pole of the moon, there is essentially no better location in the inner solar system for humankind. Uh, the temperatures are approximately, uh, on average, in the, in the sunlit uh, plateaus, uh, on the order of 40 degrees or 50 degrees Celsius. So, which is about Kuwait. <laughs> in, in, a little cooler, a little cooler and more pleasant than Kuwait. Uh, and it, it's been said, well, why would we want to go to the moon when, you know, Antarctica is much closer. Antarctica is much less pleasant than the poles of the moon. And uh, this particular uh, cartoon, this sketch is, is one that I have been, I promoted for a long time. Uh, this is uh, a, a colony at the Shackleton Crater at the exact south pole of the moon. Uh, this, such, a, such an outpost, uh, I don't want to say anything negative towards a city on Mars, but such an outpost would be uh, only three days from Earth. It could have a population of hundreds of millions of people. The water is there, the energy is there, and gigawatts of power because the sun is, uh, shines just as brightly or even more brightly on the moon than it does on Earth. So it is eventually going to play, be the place where humans can conveniently settle. So... It is certainly time, I would like to suggest, for humanity to return to the moon. This time, not to uh, just uh, put, plant the flag and hit the golf ball, uh, but to stay with respect, but also with the goal of exploration and science and eventually settlement, and to do so not alone or in competition, but to do it together and as part of a moon village. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. John. Our next guest is the director of the leading Ukrainian space company, the State Enterprise, since 2001. He was formerly a team member at the mission to, of Ukraine in the EU, science and technology, as well as space cooperation, among other things. Please help me welcome Mr. Oleg. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Salam alaikum. It's a great pleasure to stay in front of you, and uh, I would like to present my talk, which is called Together to the Moon. And you will very soon understand why it is called like this. I hope to find it without any. Okay. So. Uh, let me first introduce my company to you. As Lama rightly said, Yuzhnaya uh, Design Office is a leading Ukrainian space company and one of the world leaders in space developments. Just three days ago, on the April 10, while I was on my trip to Kuwait, the company celebrated 65th anniversary. So it was created back in 1954. And during this period of time, until today, we were able to create four generations of strategic missiles, world-class launch vehicles, on which I dwell upon a little bit more, 400 different spacecraft of almost 80 types, and about 50 types of rocket engines and propulsion systems. The number of launches we did uh, approaches 1,000 already. Our main line of activities, as I said, launch vehicles, satellites, uh, of course, uh, enabling technologies, so to say, that is rocket engines and different components. We are involved since recently uh, in the ground infrastructure development, and we are also actively working on the so-called global projects implementation. By global, I mean uh, that it is projects of interest to the whole world to, to humanity at large, uh, such as, for example, earthquakes predictions by means of satellites. If it is of interest to you, I can tell you more on this. Here is uh, the whole bunch of launch vehicles that were developed by my company during 65 years of existence, starting uh, from uh, converted intercontinental ballistic missiles 
represented by Cosmos, Cosmos 2, Cyclone 2, Cyclone 3 launchers, including our participation in the famous reply of Soviet Union to the United States, to the shuttle program, which, is, which was called Energia Buran, and uh, as a strap-on boosters in this shuttle, or Soviet shuttle, so to say, we used uh, Zenit 2 rockets, basically. Zenit is a very interesting development by my company. If you Google Elon Musk and Zenit, you will immediately learn that uh, Mr. Musk thinks that uh, the second best world, uh, rocket in the world is Zenit after his Falcon, of course. We slightly disagree with him. <laughs> we think uh, our low rocket is the best. So uh, let me quickly tell you about capabilities of Zenit, uh, which is really a cutting edge technology. Uh, for the first time in the world, we were able to launch rockets not from the land, but from the ocean based floating platform. Imagine it's the so called sea launch project which enabled us to send six ton telecommunication satellites to the geostationary orbit, 36,000 kilometers, as you may know. This uh, rocket, uh, this rocket Zenit 3SL, which stands for Sea Launch, was also adapted to the launching from, uh, from the land, and uh, it was done uh, from Baikonur. In total, we have more than 80 launchers mainly successful, of course. Uh, Dnieper launch vehicle represents a converted anti-continental ballistic missile, former SS-18 missile, which has become a workhorse for delivering uh, small satellites to the low Earth orbit. And uh, I could not avoid uh, but uh, tell you a few words about our very recent projects, which are ongoing. First, our engagement in the uh, small launcher Vega, European launcher, uh, which has made 13 flights all successful. Uh, essentially, it's a solid propellant rocket, three stages. Three first stages are solid propellant, and the upper stage is uh, driven by our company's engine, which is uh, presented on the picture, and which uh, is a very versatile engine uh, allowing you uh, to implement very different in, in nature missions by your satellites. And it is this engine which uh, serves as a prototype to the engines which I'm going to speak about in a moment in the context of the moon. Another emblematic for us project is Antares with uh, the formerly orbital uh, Sciences Corporation of the United States, now it is North of Grumman. Uh, we uh, are in charge of design and delivery of the uh, core structure of the first stage of this rocket. And you know that Antares is competing with SpaceX uh, within the uh, delivery of cargo to the International Space Station uh, as a part of the respective NASA program. We are very proud of our developments in the field of liquid propellant engines from several kilogram thrust up to 100 ton thrust and even more, 1,000 uh, ton thrust, but it is still mainly on the paper, I mean the upper level of the thrust. And here is uh, different kinds of spacecraft that we uh, designed, produced, and launched by our own rockets. In total, more than 400. Now, please allow me to show you a brief movie. I hope you It is exactly about what we are doing with Moon, what we used to do, and what we are doing today.
we were in charge within the Soviet Moon program of the so-called Block E, Development and Implementation. This is propulsion unit for landing, for, for the equipment to land on the moon surface of two pilots. Uh, you can imagine that it was extremely important task and that's why we have developed um, not only main engine with quite deep throttling at the time uh, from 2 ton to 825 kilogram but we also envisaged a redundancy in the form of the uh, reserve engine uh, and these engines were tested in space, not at the moon orbit, but in the Earth orbit, three times and multiple times on the ground. Now, I have a proposal to Kuwait, in fact, and this is something I am here for. Uh, as you might have realized, many, if not all, technologies to create a lander on the moon are there. They are available and to great extent they are available at Yuzhne. Kuwait is an ambitious country with space vision, which is coming, I suppose, and there is an opportunity for you to join forces with the country and the company like mine to create a small but efficient lunar lander, we call it lander hopper, because the idea is that if we land on the moon's surface 50 kilogram of payload with instruments developed, let's say, by Kuwait, with some technologies which I learned are already available, for example, drilling technologies, then we will be able to jump from the landing point, to, to make study of the landing point, and then jump at least two times to different areas located 20 kilometers away from the landing points. Or another option, we land 150 kilogram instead of 50, but we restrict ourselves to studying just this area. These are the major but still rough characteristics of how a lunar lander could look like. Um, important to uh, emphasize that there are several existing launch vehicles of middle class even that could bring the lander to the moon's surface. There are several elements of, uh, of the lander which are already developed, technologies are there, and as a payload, as I said, there could be a Kuwaitian payload or even several instruments, up to uh, the team to decide. The trajectory is quite traditional, I would not uh, spend much time on this, but let me now emphasize potential advantages for, for Kuwait as a country, potentially spacefaring country. First, you immediately get exposure to the whole world. As soon as you just announce the project, you are on the first pages of newspapers throughout the world. Second, prestige. You know that so far there were only three countries capable to deliver uh, payloads to the moon surface. You could immediately become a member of a light club if the project started and implemented. Third, uh, Kuwait and KFAS is the most uh, advanced institute of the country, uh, sees its mission in the development of the STI, which is Science, Technology and Innovation, as the most important uh, element of the country's economy as of today. Absolutely rightly so, and this kind of project could definitely give a great boost to, to, to the whole country, to the whole economy. It will help to develop workforce immediately. Such enthusiasts uh, as we have teams today will be multiplied in numbers many times. It will help to achieve um, sustainable development goals 
as uh, declared by the United States, uh, Nations and as defined by the United Nations. Last but not least, by no means, is that there is a huge commercial potential of this project. Should it be successfully implemented, then you could become a provider of this payload delivery services to the Moon surface together with your partners. I would like to finish by this, and I would like to say shukran vayet. <laughs> Should you have questions, I am available here for any kind of discussions and negotiations. Thank you. So next up, we have the person who is responsible for commercial payload sales and commercial client management for the mission to the, to the moon. He represents PT scientists' goals and ideals in the new space dialogue and initiative in building towards a sustainable lunar economy. Please help me welcome my copy buddy, Mr. Shaitanya Gopal. Hi. All right. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My, my first time in Kuwait, and I'm absolutely enjoying it. Thank you so much for your great hospitality. Um, more than anything, I'm genuinely impressed by the effort that I've seen in the last two days, especially all of these participants. Uh, they're more like my colleagues because I'm pretty much their age, but it's amazing to come here and see all of this effort that has been taken uh, to push space in Kuwait and bring Kuwait's voice out to the to the international community as well. Um, and thank you, Ghanim, especially for organizing this. And thank you, KFAS, for all your support. So it's amazing to be here. My name is Chetanya Gopal, and I am the sales manager and business development manager at PT Scientist. Um, we're going to talk about Mission to the Moon, and that is PT Scientist's first mission. Um, it says there going forward to Apollo 17. Um, that's because it's also very cheesy, but we don't want to say we're going back to the moon. We're going forward to the moon because the idea is to pick up on where we left about 50 years ago um, with, the, uh, with, with the Apollo landings. Um, what we're trying to bring is a commercial flavor to, to space exploration. Uh, and I'm not talking Leo or Geo, I'm talking about space exploration of, of planets and celestial bodies beyond. Um, so as I said, it's been 50 years since the Apollo landings, and we think it's an absolute opportune time for Moon. And that is, that is extremely evident with what's happening in the scenario these days, with NASA proclaiming that they want to go back to the Moon in the next five years with astronauts. Um, ESA already uh, working on plans for their version of the Moon Village, uh, but also um, in situ resource utilization uh, capabilities, and India planning missions, and China planning missions, and I think John has done a great job of telling you why Moon is relevant at all. So thank you, John, for doing so. Um, but the biggest thing is that Moon is right there. That's the biggest point. Um, we can dream of Mars, but I think we need a bit of a test bed, and Earth's not the greatest when, when it comes to test beds. So Moon then becomes a prime location for us to be a, a solar system faring um, man or humankind, rather. Um, and the Moon is a beautiful place. And I seem to also understand that the Moon is not too far from Kuwait. It's right up there. So I could see it today. <laughs> so it's, it's only obvious that we should go there. Um, and the Earth does look really beautiful from the moon and gives you that perspective. And this is something that astronauts talk about, that when they do go up into space, they get this brilliant perspective to see how beautiful the Earth is, but also how fragile it is. So we're not abandoning Earth and going to Mars. We're expanding. Um, and that's what I believe in personally as well. At PT Scientists, as I mentioned, we want to go back to the Apollo 17 landing site. Um, you can see in the picture, there is the lunar roving vehicle. And right in front of it is the Audi Luna Quattro. Um, that's one of the rovers that we are um, putting on the moon. Um, this is an interesting picture because you can see the Audi Luna Quattro and the lunar roving vehicle. How is this picture taken? Obviously, this is Photoshop, but in reality, we are sending two Audi Luna Quattros so that they can 
picture each other and be buddies. You know, we don't want to be alone in space. Um, this was all, this initiative all came out of the Google Lunar X Prize. Um, and PD Scientist was uh, once a part of that, um, uh, th that expedition. And we also won two milestone prizes. So we're, we're doing okay, I guess. Um, and the idea was to send a privately funded um, lunar lander, do a soft landing on the moon, um, then take videos and have some kind of mobility. And we check all the boxes up until now. Um, when the proposal came out, um, my CEO was actually having a barbecue with some of his friends. And back in the day, he was a 22-year-old uh, data security specialist um, for the German government. And over barbecue, uh, he asked a simple question. Is there a reason we can't go to the moon? Um, as an aerospace engineer, I could have given him plenty. Um, but as someone who did not know about space too much, um, he and his friends decided, yeah, why not? I mean, let's, let's try. How far can we get? And that's something I would also like you and uh, people to Kuwait to think. And not just the moon, but why can't we do something? Um, and if you can't think of an answer, just go do it. Because um, that's sometimes the best ways to, to go about business. Um, so out of this curiosity, um, 10 years later uh, of hard work, we created Mission to the Moon. Uh, this is a PD scientist-led uh, effort. And we're really proud to have Audi and Vodafone as our key technology partners um, also on this mission. So what do we exactly do with this particular mission? Um, there's four broad uh, things that we focus on. First is to perform a, a landing, a soft landing, because again, we're going to the historical, um, historical uh, Apollo 17 site. We don't want to disturb anything. Uh, so we go back to the Apollo 17 site, perform a soft landing. Then we deploy the two Audi Luna Quattro roving vehicles, and we, we have five kilograms of payload on each of those uh, rovers. So they also do experiments um, around uh, the area. And we also deploy the first 4G LTE network. Again, I know that sounds cheesy, but LTE is a proven technology on Earth, and it is scalable. At least we hope so. Um, so with Vodafone and Nokia Bell Labs, we've, de uh, we've developed the, uh, the base station for 4G LTE, and we're hoping that we can control the rovers and other payloads, other commercial payloads, using the LTE network. Um, also because LTE is fast. So that's one of the reasons. And finally, um, some, for someone like me, I never, or I mean, I'm not old enough to have, have had the, the Apollo moment. Um, and I think that's really, that's something that's been missing uh, for, for, for some of us, um, especially in this room. So we then collaborate with Red Bull Media House, which is one of the largest media agencies in the world, to do a global event and live stream this um, over, over three different channels and have a 12-month campaign leading up to, the, up to the launch. And basically, you can live stream this event on your phones. So the, the, the amount of reach and eyes that we're expecting is about 1 to 3 billion people. And I think this is the major, major effect of, some, of a mission like this. Um, it's getting to the people and making them believe that it's not only you know, the, the creme de la creme of the world that can do something like this. It's five guys who are sitting in their barbecue, uh, in their garage doing a barbecue. They can send a space mission as well. Um, as I mentioned, we are really proud to have Audi and Vodafone as our key technology partners. But along with that, we don't forget our institutional partners. So obviously, we have ESA, we have DLR, who are really close uh, with us in, in working. We also have university partnerships, um, and then and so on and so forth. PD scientist, I mean, the full form was part-time scientist, uh, but now we're 70 full-time employees who work there, really. So I think we need to work on a bit of a rebranding, but we stick with PD scientists for now. Um, that's the team that is, being, uh, that is leading right now, and there's about 50 people in technical development, there's about 10 each in commercial business strategy, that's one of me, and then general management administration, but we're always hiring. Uh, in the last one year itself, from, we've gone from 20 in the Berlin offices to about 70 people. Uh, so we're really ramping up, and we're always looking for, for um, you know, new talents from across the world, so wink, wink, guys. Um, but what is our core business then? What do we really do? Um, we have two base products. The Alina, which is the autonomous landing um, and navigation module, 
and the ALQ, which is the Audi Luna Quattro. Um, Alina is a two and a half ton uh, class lander, a lunar lander, which is capable of delivering about 300 kilograms of payload to the moon. Um, and it comes with the other services. The, um, there's the ubiquitous 4G LTE service that we offer, there's power that we offer, and there's obviously uh, communication and data links to Earth as well, back and forth. Um, with the ALQ, um, there's an added layer of the fact that there's mobility. So if there's payloads that require any kind of mobility, they can be attached to the Audi Luna Quattro. Um, there's three cameras on board. So there's two HD cameras to take stereoscopic uh, video. And then there's a multi-spectral camera because we would like to do some science as well um, and analyze the materials um, on the lunar roving vehicle and how they've fared in the last 50 years. This is what our business plan is. This is not a single moonshot for us. This is a, an actual business that we hope we can evolve in such a fashion. Uh, so we start with our first flight in somewhere about 2021. Um, and that's the first mission, the mission to the moon, which goes to the Apollo 17 side. But mission two onwards is then what we start talking business. And what John mentioned in his, um, in his presentation as well, this, the South Pole. Um, and those are the more lucrative places to go when it comes to actual resources and point, places of interest. Um, then we also collaborate with the European Space Agency on the ISRU mission, which is dedicated towards in situ resource utilization. Just to clear it out, in situ resources means you don't take anything from Earth, you utilize the resources available to you on the moon, and then you create products out of it or something that you can use. Um, this is all a part of the moon village. And it's not a single moon village, as he mentioned. It's anything and everything that contributes towards the moon village. What we're doing right, right now here, this is a moon village as well. It's a community that is thinking about going to the moon. And I think it's really important. But obviously, in the future, we're, we're aligned with the moon village. We're aligned with the for all moon kind, obviously, because we go to the Apollo landing site. So we want to be really careful with what we do there. Um, but we're open to international collaboration. And again, reiterating, that's the way forward, where all of us come together and support each other in, in many different ways we can. And when we talk of collaboration, obviously, space belongs to everyone is our prime motto. Um, and when I say space belongs to everyone, it surely does belong to Kuwait as well. So what opportunities does Kuwait have, uh, specifically when we talk about the moon and, and, and space uh, in general? So after a lot of discussions that I've had in yesterday, um, especially with these, these participants, I've realized that Kuwait <laughs> is a land of ideas and exploring new frontiers. Hence, you also have the ship. Uh, it'd be so beautiful if that ship could be a spaceship. I would love that. Uh, but we also like to align ourselves with Kuwait's um, Vision 2035. Um, I picked out four of the examples there that are listed. Um, global positioning. Space, there's about 18 spacefaring nations, if I can think of them, I mean, using European Space Agency as a single one. There's about 18 in the world. Um, being one of those is, as um, Professor Oleg mentioned, puts you in an elite club. We obviously don't like to call it the elite club because we want to break the barriers, but at least it pr puts Kuwait in a situation where it is a cut above the rest. Creative human capital. Um, I, I don't think anything could be more creative than using the skills that you have in, in, in what you do in the space industry. And we're not only talking about uh, engineers. Uh, we're talking about space policymakers, space lawyers. We're talking about space artists, even. There's Everything that you, get, that you do on Earth can be translated to something that can be also done in space. So it doesn't have to be engineering. It doesn't have to be STEM. Um, it, it comes from liberal arts. It comes from humanities and all places. Everything can be applied to space in some form or the other. And trust me, coming from an engineer, I need someone to tell me the policy. Un otherwise, I don't want to speak in French right now. Um, cutting edge infrastructure. That is absolutely at the forefront of space technology. And I, I'm going to expand upon that later. And sustainable and diversified economy. Again, space, as I mentioned, is not just a single sector. It has multiple different voices in the sector itself. So space exploration does check all of those. Um, so in collaboration with, um, with some of the members here, we're trying to put Kuwait on the moon um, on our first PD scientist mission. And we're trying to send a scientific payload to the moon. Um, 
And this would hopefully spark a new um, era of entrepreneurship in the space domain, in the space exploration domain, but also um, in, in just entrepreneurship in general and bring more, uh, more opportunities in STEM, in, in high-tech technologies. And obviously, it would really help Kuwait in rebranding itself as they want to do with new Kuwait. When we talk about the cutting edge developments, these are some technologies we personally at PD Scientists do focus at. There's the LTE network, there's the lunar positioning system, but we're also trying to support human spaceflight in the future. Um, and we look at lunar night survival and power generation, and these are topics that really need to be um, worked out in the next few years if you want a sustainable human base um, on, uh, on the moon. And finally, I'd like to leave you with a bit of a visual here, and this is how we think the progression of uh, the moon, um, moon economy or the moon village is going to be in the next few years. Mission control come in. Departing for expedition. Over. Mission goal. All data looks beautiful. Channel's clear. Over. Armstrong. 1969. Apollo 17, 1972. It is so amazing to have Audi on board. They really fund our, our production capabilities. It's brilliant. But thank you so much. And again, it's amazing to be part of this uh, initiative in, in Kuwait. And feel free to get in touch with me here or even after this. And I would love to see Kuwait in space someday. Thank you so much. Thank you for, very much for our speakers. So we have opportunities, and those opportunities are not the only opportunities we have in Kuwait. Our young professionals and students, in two days only, they also thought about three different ideas, which are really amazing. For now, I'm going to have it very fast. Uh, we will have a very fast uh, panel discussion. I'm going to ask a few, few questions for our audience. So I'm going to join you here. Does that work? Yeah. yeah, it works. So I would like to start with Mr. John. So your, topic, your presentation topic was about going, going uh, why the moon now? But there is a small question here. We have a heritage of delaying moon missions since a very long time ago. And I would like just to mention a small example. The International Lunar Exploration Working Group under the United Nations, in 2004, they announced a roadmap. And by 2018, if I am not wrong, or 2017, phase three was about to have human in the lunar surface. And, by, and phase four, 2020, to have structures and you know, the, the concept or a base in the lunar surface. This trend, is it reversing or is it going to continue in the future? We have a plans to the moon. For example, NASA announced a few weeks ago, 2024, we will have boots. The Americans, they will have American astronauts in the lunar surface. So is it going to reverse? Is that heritage going to change? So just one small correction. In fact, the announcement of the new uh, objective vis-a-vis -vis the moon landing for the US was just about one week ago. So it's, it's uh, very fresh. Um, I think the, uh, the history of planning for the moon is littered with plans put together by advocates 
which did not ultimately secure uh, resources from critical stakeholders, uh, particularly uh, for the past 30 years in uh, government ministries and in uh, Congresses or parliaments or, or uh, key decision makers within administrations. And um, I was involved in a number of those, including the uh, Space Exploration Initiative in 1989, where I was the lead for the technology planning. Uh, and again in uh, 19, sorry, in 2004, 2005, when I was involved with the and helped to frame the vision for space exploration. And I was the lead for the technology program for the vision for space exploration. Uh, I think, uh, in fact, that the situation is now changing and has changed and will continue to change. One, for the reasons that I mentioned, uh, namely uh, because there is a, uh, a tr completely new motivation for the moon. Two, because of the uh, development and access to uh, fundamentally more economical technologies, including launch, including uh, in-space systems. Um, and three, because essentially the whole world is going. And so I think that uh, although there may be shifts, uh, it delays, uh, variations in particular missions, I think when you take them overall, and if I didn't show that particular slide which I showed during our workshop uh, yesterday, uh, there are something like uh, three dozen missions, landings, orbiters, CubeSats, uh, launches, test beds, demos, the beginnings of launch of the gateway, on and on and on over the next six or seven years and involving uh, uh, a dozen or more countries. So this is almost like a, a rush, like a wave uh, for the moon and for the development of the capabilities to allow various countries to operate on the moon. And I think, uh, again, there will be various changes here and there, but the situation is uh, profoundly different. So the historical her heritage we have of delaying moon project is changing. Yes. Do you agree with that, Professor Ulib? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I would stress um, one particular aspect, which uh, out of those mentioned by John, it's uh, drastically changing technologies which allow you to achieve more with the lesser cost. It's, it's a fundamental change in my view, and it drives uh, the whole process everywhere in the world. That's great. Uh, so, so, Mr. Ch Ch Chaitanya, I have a different question since BT Scientist is new in the business. Um, do you think you will land a lander in the moon by 2020? No, but we hope to land a lander, inshallah, by 2021. Um, I mean 2021. <laughs> so, we can, the first mission that we fly is uh, is a technical demonstration mission, don't get me wrong. We haven't, the flight hardware is not proven. The components have been proven. The flight hardware itself, how it works together, is, um, I mean, space is hard. That's the least I can say. Uh, and for a company which doesn't have unlimited resources, um, we would rather be a year or two late than to risk and put our money um, down the drain. So we would like to make sure all systems are go before we can achieve our first flight. And once we know the business, once we know how to do it once, you can see us fly every other year, for sure. Because this is really exciting. This is a startup company who are aiming to have a lander in the moon. And this is a big challenge, definitely. So um, I will change the topic. I I'm gonna go faster. Um, the Moon Village Association is very, very clear, clear about uh, calibration and co cooperation. Uh, last week, uh, Vice President Mike Pence justifies uh, an urgency plan to land in the moon by uh, saying that the United States is racing against, against their uh, uh, enemies. And this is a small sentence with two harsh keywords, um, race 
and enemies, obviously China and, and Russia. This is not cooperation and collaboration. This is a competition. So how, how do you comment on that as Moon Village Association? Yeah. So the, the, um, uh, I think the, the most interesting uh, fact of the last two years, even the last uh, six months, uh, when you look at this slide, which I showed yesterday, uh, and you see this swarm of uh, a dozen countries and two dozen missions all going to the moon, the most striking part of that, over the next uh, uh, six years, seven years, the most striking part of that until one week ago is that the U.S. was not included. And so I, I see this um, argument as uh, an important one within the U.S. in order to uh, encourage uh, funding and resources for this but also almost a recognition that the U.S. was not involved in this uh, fundamental movement of uh, humanity. From the standpoint of the Moon Village Association, uh, we recognize that individual countries, individual space programs, individual companies are in fact in competition. And I will point to the, my colleagues on my right. Uh, one, a member of the board and an institutional member of the Moon Village Association, Yushinoi. The other, a, an in, another institutional member, an, a mature company, seven, 65 years in the making, a new startup, 65 weeks in the making. <laughs> and yet... longer than that. And I know, I know. It was, <laughs> but it was funnier that my way. I, I, it's a, but, um, and yet, even though both of them are offering transportation services to the moon, both of them offer the technologies, and they are not alone. There are a wide variety of others. Nevertheless, they are together as members of the Moon Village Association. So we can both compete and we can cooperate in order to take humanity forward. If you allow me, Ghanim, I yeah, will sure. even extend a little bit what John just said. Despite the harsh words that you utilized citing uh, Pence, uh, there is a cooperation even between the United States and China nowadays, precisely on the moon. It, yeah. it is a well-known fact that uh, there was an agreement between NASA and China Space Administration on uh, monitoring landing by the Chinese Chang'e 4 uh, for the purposes of learning experience on how future missions by the United States or somebody else uh, could be organized to avoid something or, on the other hand, to foresee something. And it was clearly stated from the very beginning that the data which will be received will be shared among all the community at the UN level. So it's really both competition and cooperation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Shaitanya, can you also tell us more examples about cooperative models, let's say, in the business between BT scientists and other countries that might be suitable for Kuwait? I'll start with the, the playground that we used to. Um, we came out from the Google Lunar X Prize, but we were not the only ones. Um, there was another entity that um, did try something last week or a few, few days ago. But there's also other companies in the US like Astrobotic, there's iSpace from, from Tokyo. Um, and so for us, competition, we see it as an enabler. Um, if I was the only one, or if, if PD Scientist was the only company here telling you that, hey, we're a commercial company and we can land on the moon, follow us, I think people would think that we're crazy. And why aren't other people following you then, right? But once you have the validation of a, a emerging or, or, or rather um, a bubbling um, marketplace that is possible uh, with competition, that sort of promotes a nascent market in, in, in its own self. Um, so what we see uh, with, you know, uh, when, when other companies lay down plans is that we see an uptick in inquiries on our end as well. So it's for us, and especially in space, uh, competition is healthy. Um, Yes, when you start pulling it to a geopolitical level, it can get a bit nasty. Um, but
but that's the reality of life and uh, the world we live in. But uh, competition is absolutely needed when it comes to uh, even companies like uh, PT scientists and not just countries. Mm -hmm. I would definitely go through this in a longer time. I mean, we are limited on time, unfortunately, and we need to listen to our um, uh, young professionals and students. So I would like to end it with a final uh, comment or note from each of you. I would like to start with Mr. John. So I, I would just say, again, um, how tremendous it's been to be here in Kuwait the last several days. And um, based on everything that has happened in the last decade, one of the most amazing changes is that um, the moon is well within the reach of a country like Kuwait. And because everything having to do with the moon is almost completely new, it's, uh, again, millions, not billions. It's uh, years, not decades. And there is so much to do that there is almost nothing but opportunity. If you pick your niche, one, two, three niches wisely, strategically, uh, you can be, if not the best, at the worst, number two. It's, it's uh, the first mover or the second mover in whole new uh, areas of technology and new accomplishments in science. So it's really quite remarkable. Um, I would not repeat what my colleagues have already said many times, um, but I would like to emphasize that indeed, while International Space Station, for example, was and is, still is, an elite club of five participants, Moon is open to everybody, to both countries and even individuals, if you have something to contribute to the general endeavor. So for Kuwait, it's different, uh, definitely something uh, to closely look at and to decide on participation. Uh, having reliable partners, you can prepare your new generations for successful careers for successful implementation of the country's vision, and I'm speaking not only about space vision, but the country development goals, and uh, Moon is exactly the project in, in a wider sense which you have to decide to be part of. I, I sincerely impressed by your enthusiasm, by your capabilities already existing, and by your potential. I believe that we will welcome Kuwait both in our space community at large and at the Moon Village Association pretty soon. Finally, just to uh, build upon what John and Professor Ole have said here, space is very different from what it used to be when the Apollo landings happened. Um, back in the day, NASA ha would have to do everything from, from launching, from, create, from building the launch pad itself, to actually then training the astronauts. We live in an age now that space is more like an economy on Earth, where I can be the cargo transport and provide you LTE service, but where SpaceX or um, any other company can provide you the launch service. So what Kuwait needs to find right now is, as John mentioned, that specific niche, maybe one, two, or three, and based on probably the core competencies that, Sp uh, that Kuwait already has, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, oil and gas um, uh, mining and uh, natural resource mining, or could find a new niche. Uh, could be technology, could be data analytics, could be something. And Moon is right now the perfect place to do that. Because again, the first and the second mover advantage. Um, so what we need is engagement. And that's all we need from Kuwait. And I think that would be a start of something beautiful. Thank you very much for your time. You. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite our honorable judges, Mr. Abdelaziz Larayib and Mr. Abdelwahab Zaydan. Mr. Abdelaziz Larayib is a physics teacher in the Institute of the Technical Training, former coordinator and project manager <coughs> in reconstruction in Kuwait National Museum Planetarium with a master's degree in astrophysics. And Mr. Abdelaziz Larayib, or uh, sorry, Abdul Wahab Zaydan, is an innovation strategist and the assistant manager in the business and development division in Bobian Bank. Please take your seats.
So the judging criteria for tonight's competition is the following. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> presentation, the first category is presentation of the main project with four subcategories in each. So each category has 10 points. First is clarity of idea, idea originality, presentation skills, viability and achievability. The second category is participation. And what we mean by participation is involvement with five points. Last is personality and that revolves around teamwork. So all judges decisions are final and individual marks will not be disclosed. The winning team will get the chance of attending two of the greatest or hugest uh, space conferences today. Uh, the Space Generation Congress and the International Astronomical Congress in Washington, D.C. So please now let us welcome the first particip participating team, Lunar Arc, with their presentation, Kuwait Lunar Lab. Before we kick off, uh, since we are kind of the face of everybody that's going to come afterwards, <laughs> Um, I'll take just a few seconds. Um, this initiative in and out of itself is wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think um, both having students and new professionals and people who are f just finishing their degrees all together, um, seeing something that has to do with space, finally, <laughs> and totally accessible to us is beautiful. Um, so over the course of 48 hours, we learned quite a lot. We had quite a lot of fun. We joked a lot. We ate a lot of sweets and food. And that's always good. <laughs> Free food. <laughs> so. Oh, I know. <laughs> so um, uh, we'll we'll start off just because our team name had an A, so we started first. Um, so um, how do we say? Uh, introducing myself. My name is Muhammad Ali. My fellow teammates, Maryam El Galaf, Dan El Marzouk, um, we had this beautiful opportunity to work together and use our strengths uh, together. Um, what we envision is the collective dreams and hopes that we had and still have uh, for our new initiative in a new lunar era, a title by our esteemed teammate, Dana. Um, what we noticed during our um, exploration over the last 48 hours was there is a huge push towards uh, going to the moon. What we noticed is, especially regionally, there is a lack of access to, to simulation and testing lunar labs for smaller or new established companies or uh, startups or people who are just generally interested, either from universities or students or even hobbyists. And if these centers do exist, they exist globally within enclosed centers or for established agencies. If not the case, these small entities have to make their own labs in order to do these tests. And that creates a huge amount of costs they, and difficulty in producing these products to their full potentiality. Um, and then the decision making of which spec certification that should happen and so on and so forth. And within this, we found opportunity as we said that there's a scattered center for all of these labs there uh, as we said that there's a scattered centers for all of these labs they're all over the world there's also as we said a lack of established lunar chambers for testing and simulation because the ones for Mars sadly we cannot use also for lunar testing. So this is a great opportunity for Kuwait coming into the global uh, effect towards a new lunar based era as a leader as a very much needed venue for lunar effect. So we propose that uh, we can create a simulation and testing ecosystem um, in a single hub where all of the testing labs are all in one place in the Kuwaiti desert. So why this and why now? Um, it, with the development of technology, the ease of access, I mean, the internet kind of gave us a lot of leeway into this stuff. And, and within our pockets, we have technology that is stronger than anything space agencies had back in the day when they first started. Um, there is 
beautiful time instead of working in competition that we work collaborative collaboratively and establish first a regional effort to utilize what is already around us it is time especially when kuwait is looking towards a new identity especially when petroleum's um, stature in the economy is going down there is many venues to go through and this is one of them this is a way to transform and space uh, let's be honest is quite romantic and there is a lot of love and passion in it regardless of any discipline you're in for example my colleagues are in physics but i'm an architect and that's enough proof to show to showcase this um and who cares really um and for what reason um there are already regional players in the Middle East that are engaging in, in space-related activity. There is a lot of focus, especially for Mars, but not so much for the lunar effort. Um, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and even Oman, uh, surprisingly, as we found out today, have efforts into, into, into establishing this space presence. Um, what we see is that instead of the, our regional players having to travel all over, try to find these test beds and whatnot, that they can just come through us. In this, in this regard, we reestablish the spirit of collaboration, of working together for both private and small entities. There is a lot of people I've met in Kuwait that have this energy in their hearts that they want to explore. I found a lot of research papers when I was in Colombia from Dr. Hala about this, and I found a lot of enthusiasts like myself that are very much in love with space. So this is a way to reignite youth as a national power and re reignite researchers as the gateway for, for a healthy and a long-term project. This is not something that happens within five years and dies. This is for a very, very, very long time that we can work with. And within collaboration and creating this hub for people to come with a lot of chambers that work cohesively, then we can have multiple testing abilities for equipments and landers and rovers and payloads, and it will grow over time. And this is the beauty of having a quick start into, into the lunar game. So risks and costs, usually with anything dealing with space, um, the return revenue is not immediate. It takes time. It's like a seed that needs to grow, and with any tree that grows, it takes just a tad bit of time. So its fruits are very clear, and then we can taste this beautiful nectar that comes out of it. Um, and to establish Kuwait as an attractive program, there needs to be, of course, precedent and research that we establish and reason for it to bring people here. And then the cost of, of course, hiring and training qualified people and bringing material uh, for these uh, simulation environments and so on and so forth. Um, in this regard, we, we thought about the importance of establishing uh, milestones for this program. So as Mohammed said, these are like hopeful milestones that us as a team would like to reach. So 2019, which is now, is when we started planning for this and making this organization happen. By hopefully 2022, we want to start opening some of the facilities and start uh, these private organizations and the public organizations can start using these facilities to test and simulate a lunar environment. Hopefully, by 2024, these big corporations have used a lot of the facilities and have created many new products for lunar, explore, uh, explore, uh, for lunar settlement. And by that time, also, we have a training program to hopefully open up to the Kuwaiti graduates, like uh, Kuwaiti engineers, to learn how to maintain these equipments. And by 2030 is the, to open new facilities for the public, more like education centers. We can help educate the kids about these future programs and get them to like this topic, to grow up in this topic, to hopefully become part of it. And hopefully, as we said, by new Kuwait 2035, we would like to produce a first Kuwaiti produced product that was produced in this facility and tested in facility to have, hopefully we can send it to the moon. And after 2035, hopefully we can expand all these sectors, expand more facilities, add new facilities. Um, organizations can maybe, they can add facilities too, so it cannot just be Kuwait, it can be an international where NASA might have their own sector or anything like that. And yeah, that's possibly our timeline and milestones. 
And yes, these are like some of the ecosystems that we have like hopefully create, create for the lunar surface. These are like the chambers that we hope to have in this uh, hub that we would create. We would have a thermal vacuum testing chamber. We would have a thermal cycling testing chamber to simulate cold and very, very hot and very cold uh, environment and a chaotic chamber uh, to measure like the electromagnetic interference, environment testing to test the lunar surface because it's very different but also very similar because the uh, query desert would help that a lot, um, to uh, chemical testing to simulate a lunar regolith, um, a human machine system testing to simulate mission operations, like testing the time delay, because there is a time delay between like uh, the communications b the, from between the moon and the earth, so we would like to test that. Um, and there's also what we would like to have in the middle of all of these chambers to have a full simulation, uh, incorporating all of these simulations in one, so we can test um, a full on uh, like a lunar simulation, including all of these. So in this big chamber that we'd like to have, we can, uh, an example of it is uh, we can, because uh, uh, the uh, daytime of the moon is 28 days, so we can simulate it in a fully lit chamber uh, where like the moon is in direct sunlight, see how all of these um, uh, vehicle, uh, the possible uh, rovers and all of these equipment can handle these extreme uh, environments, including also in pitch black uh, um, environments, how they can survive all of that, and many other different types of simulations. So um, building off the presentation that John gave us, um, the way we thought about this is, is taking the architectural elements that we can establish such a system through. There is a main goal of exploring the lunar surface and doing all the required tests that um, a, to develop, uh, develop uh, uh, systems um, and then uh, specific procedures for grant support and mission operation simulations. Um, through that, we can build a lot of scientific research. We can simulate human operations and safety systems and also work as collaborative parts towards analogs that already do uh, long-term human presence for space. Um, our mission, uh, why we did this, uh, it's because it's built from our experiences, our hopes, and our dreams. We see potential here and all, our, and all the av available resources in our country. We would like to have our mission intense and uh, excite youth, professionals, and also different bodies, regionally and uh, beyond. Uh, the, uh, the effort is eventually uh, to create our own uh, quality spec standard that is applicable in our region so that uh, instead of uh, sending them abroad, we utilize strategic agreement to uh, test and stimulate to spec in Kuwait uh, by removing logical and, uh, constraints and uh, accelerating the process. The beauty of this process is the ability in the future to uh, uh, re uh, reprocess uh, the resource in Kuwait for uh, production at uh, lubricate uh, for uh, machinery joints, uh, dribbling equipment, uh, and uh, re-establishing at uh, petrochemical labs, and uh, this time for new economic gain. Uh, it's a way to segue into Kuwait uh, from uh, cons uh, from consumer to a producer. This uh, uh, in uh, initiative will bring other entities uh, to collaborate, peer uh, review, and aid in uh, uh, developing of a global collaborative e ecosystem. This will bring Kuwait prominently uh, to a lunar global leader to intensive and uh, stimulate ecosystem. Thank you. Oh, one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was quick. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I think she already talked about this generally, uh, but we what we would like to show in the last very intense 30 minutes that uh, brought our nerves to wreck, we managed to do this very quick image of what a simulation center in Kuwait would look like to utilize our empty desert. Um, 
uh, even in research, even in architecture, we, we spoke with Chaitana about this, and it is beautiful that we have such an extreme environment. And even, even after the Gulf War, with the destruction of most of our environment, we can look at this as a blessing in disguise. Um, the reestablishment of um, exploration within that environment alone brings a lot of opportunity, not just for lunar exploration, but also the healthiness of being with our own environment. And within this, we can see already what the Kuwait Lunar Lab would look like. Thank you very much. And I would like to th I would like to thank Aurad. Arad Lisbeyi, she is a high school student that joined us in the last hour and a half. Uh, her presence and energy gave us energy to keep going without much sleep. <laughs> and so, thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, Dana, and Maryam for your exceptional presentation. And now I would like to call upon our second team, Delayla. Please come up. for coming so uh, we're gonna be shorter I promise much shorter <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, thank you so you're probably wondering why there's a picture of the desert behind me and not the moon space and all the other things that we saw today and how is this desert gonna relate to the moon village association good morning everybody ladies and gentlemen judges esteemed guests everybody in the house uh, we are Delila team Delila basically in Arabic means a person who knows where he's going in the desert. So we're going to extract that word and use it as our team name. Uh, the name will tie into Delila's objective slowly as the presentation goes on. So what is our objective? Our objective is to present the implementable vision of Kuwait space involvement in the emerging space field with the assistance of MBA as a platform. Okay, so what, you're probably wondering how are we going to meet our objective, right? Um, so basically we wanted to identify what makes Kuwait uh, different from other countries. And then we wanna utilize uh, the Kuwait uh, strong points uh, in order to enter this space era. Um, also, we want to present to you the benefits of Delila's approach. Um, we want to just list out very quickly um, why is Kuwait fully equipped and perfect for this initiative? Um, Kuwait has scarce resources. Therefore, we're very careful uh, about how to utilize these opportunities and uh, our small land of ours. Uh, we have uh, a great experience in drilling, uh, which KOC could uh, help us out with. We have a vast global professional network that uh, KFAS could provide us uh, with. We have an established geological and sustainable water and development research facilities uh, from KFAS and a great experience with reservations of soil and land from KIPA. So putting all these together, how are we going to approach this problem? Approach a problem which is how do we get into the space era fast with the least time and make an impact because that's what we're aiming to do. When we combine all these together, the sustainable water, the experience in geology, the experience in drilling, we are taking and we're going to be part of the first step when we go to the moon. And by doing so, not only are we just doing it just to say that we did it, we're doing it actually and we're getting a return in profit. And we're actually giving back the, co the community and everybody else something that they can use. Well, if we send a rover, they say, okay, everybody else has sent a rover. It's very difficult. But if we give them something a little bit different, which they can use, they're going to be looking at it a different way. As of right now, for the moon, there is no subsurface element composition maps. There is no 
thermal maps and the effect of drilling with there is no environmental effects that are clear if we use the geological experience if we use the kisser kifas and all those together and the experience from KOC, we can establish a data bank for existing resources, and now data is very important. The second thing is our extensive experience in drilling can give us lessons learned that we can relay to the people on top of the moon that are saying, okay, when we drill, what's going to happen? Well, as extensive research we have in the, in the drilling and lessons learned, root cause analysis, we can provide that. We can give that directly there, and we can be a key player. Sorry. Um, so basically, um, I said earlier about the benefits of uh, Delila's approach, and I think you want to talk yes. about the vision. It helps assist in Kuwait in 2035 vision, off the bat, directly, uh, by developing a prosperous, diversifying economy to reduce the country's dependency on oil export revenues. We are creating a product, not just involving ourselves, but also a product. Uh, we are helping assisting UNSDG. Also, a geopolitical stand. When we have something to offer and we have the expertise and the mapping of the area, we can basically put ourselves in a position where sooner or later everything has to be regulated. Nobody can just go and drill whatever they want. There has to be some kind of regulation. If we provide the information and we can give the advice, we are putting ourselves in a geopolitical stand which we are used to having. Right now, we are always in the middle trying to make peace with a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, countries. By doing so, we can relate that to, to space and we can relate, relate that to the UN and our reputation so far as a geopolitical player is great. So to expand more on the benefits of Delila's approach, we want to uh, uh, use uh, bootstrapping uh, into our uh, strategy uh, in order to make this more feasible. Uh, and uh, easier for our partners. So we decided to just be honest and list our uh, benefits even more. Uh, we're saying that we want to minimize the implementation uh, for execution, and we are cutting costs uh, using our resources and our networks and uh, readiness time. If we're all collaborating uh, as one entity, uh, I think we could see this feasible in a really short time. Uh, we also said uh, that you know the the, the data collected uh, will be the first of its kind, and it's crucial for uh, creating this needed product. Uh, as everyone knows now, data is uh, the new black gold. So I think uh, we'll be uh, the first in the market to have this kind of data using our partners and resources. And we also said that spreading the word uh, of our activities, such as this event, uh, to other space communities, potential governments and companies through uh, MVA, uh, which stands for uh, Moon uh, Village Association. Uh, and also collaborating with other existing programs. So uh, Moon Village Association has working groups, and uh, we recently studied those, and they consist of coordination and cooperation, cultural considerations which we can understand these policies and apply them to Kuwait. Uh, we said outreach and education. Uh, like such these events for uh, space awareness to, to Kuwaitis and even the GCC. Um, uh, also to understand the mission and market requirements data, uh, moon market economies, and uh, moon village standards. Thank you and your questions. Questions? Just one. Go ahead. How are you going to gather this uh, new data, like creating thermal maps? Is it using satellites of other companies? And Excellent question. Excellent question. Basically, what we're going to do is that we want to enter the market very fast. And what we have right now is the geological experience, the experience for water reserves, which, is, which right now all the missions are going to the place where there's water, and we have the drilling experience. Collaborated with someone else, such as PT scientists, or such as the esteemed uh, gentleman's uh, company. We can reach there faster, and we can have a direct and non, 
non, uh, it's a budget friendly idea where we know exactly what we need based on our experience, based on our experience on the ground by drilling and bio by geology, we can get the data very fast. So we have a lot of people who can provide the resources, but in the end, the, the most valuable, which is the data that we're going to extract, we're going to keep for ourselves. Therefore, we'll always be in a profit margin, pro profit uh, area. Other questions? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I have a question. Uh, when you said drilling, okay, yeah. so that means you have to have equipment there to drill. Okay. Are you anticipating like one meter, two meter, or like drilling a thousand yeah. feet? Okay. Yeah. This point. From our experience, Kuwait is equipped to drilling one meter and really deeper into the thousands of meters, I believe, or like like last time when we talked about the three different areas of oil mm -hmm. up to 15,000 meters. So mm -hmm. we are not concerned about how deep we have to drill because the capability is there. We are just worried about in terms of environmental. We don't, we want to sustain it. We don't want to just drill and say we drill. We want to drill it and at the same time keep it. Keep it clean, keep it good, and keep it environmentally friendly. And we can assist with that because we have experience with drilling. Also as well, our drilling positions are always far. They're not close. An another aspect of this where we can minimize the budget is we know exactly what we need, how long do we need it, and how long the job is going to take, the resources it's going to take, because we already tabulated the resources that we need when we go and drill somewhere. And uh, For example, if it's going to be a manned mission, how much food, how much time, how much energy, how much manpower that we need. If it's not, then how much power in terms of electricity, how much does it use, how many drill bits does it use, and so on and so forth. This information is with uh, within us. We have the experience. We're just going to apply it to a new type of rock. Yeah, I had a question. Yes. Uh, just to clarify, so uh, you want to utilize the experiences that we have in Kuwait yes. to actually extract the data on the moon yes. and then create this database. So, yes. uh, so, so, so it's not actually using the existing data that we have now because it's no. not relevant, but you're actually going to actually do that on yes. the moon. For accuracy. Think we're purposes. using our data as experience and reference. Okay. Yes. okay. And the technical know how. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, so, when you say now you're dealing with data, yes. are you also the creator of the data? So, do you build the hardware that gets the data? Yes. Or are you only on the downstream data analytics side of things? We can be part of the data extraction and the data analytical because there are startups in Kuwait which have, uh, are going towards the tech area, and they are very capable because most of them are graduates from within the U.S., within all these nations, and within Kuwait University itself, and we have extremely high-level professors at Kuwait University which can assist also from, from the steam guest college. There, are, there is great, great support. So, so basically you are going to have Christmas trees on the moon? No. <laughs> uh, we have some drilling... Machines yes, because that's, uh, this is the acronym for, uh, yes, they call it cr uh, Christmas trees. Yeah. The, uh, the oh, and, and palm trees. Yes, yes, and <laughs> you are from the oil industry, so you know. <laughs> oh, good, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. good. Any more questions? Go ahead. Yeah. No, this is going to be a private company, a consulting company? Uh, no, not a private company. We know that... Kifas has a strong point. Kisar has a strong point. Kuwait University has a strong point. They're all strong in something. We want to combine them all together under one umbrella. What do you want to call this umbrella? The easiest one. We're not picky. Whichever one, one comes, whether it's going to be from a specific ministry or it's going to be a different ministry or it's going to be a leading arm from somewhere, it's, it's, it's all good. And all the technical and scientific parties can all have a chair, sit together, and the vote can be equal. We'll make it as collaborative as possible because we do need it. Any any other questions? If there's no more questions, I just wanted to say uh, uh, thank you, uh, Lama and uh, Ghanem, uh, for giving us the opportunity to contribute for something that we never thought possible for Kuwait. And uh, thank you to our mentors and uh, instructors and uh, judges for your time. Uh, you really enlightened us on so many things that we weren't aware of. So, thanks. Thank you, Jinan. Thank you, Yusuf. And thank you, Noah.
for the exceptional idea. Uh, our following and last participating team is MedPower. So please join us. As we all know, most of the energy on most of the energy sources on Earth are not available on the moon. Wind, air, and petrol are not there. Even sun heat is not uh, the, that useful because the high heat can damage the solar cells. That's why we can. Uh, that's why we came up with a new idea which uh, might help us to solve those problems and make living on the moon possible. Uh, as a mid-power team, my teammate Miriam is going to present the energy part, while Ron is going to present the medical. Okay, so we will start with this illustration, which has been done by my teammate, uh, Maryam, today. Um, uh, so as we see, um, there is a hole up there. So this is the moon hole. So instead of uh, drilling new holes uh, on the moon, so as Yusuf said, um, we can drill uh, new holes because we know nothing, not nothing, but we don't have enough data about the surface itself or the elements on the uh, surface. So we're using the moon holes um, and putting that iron tower, and this is the moon hole, and it will be polished with the silicon, um, which will be extracted from the moon surface, because the moon surface is rich with the uh, silicon. Um, the silicon mirror will reflect the sun rays and just uh, reflected to the moon, uh, to the iron tower. So here's the iron tower. Here's the silicon mirror. The silicon mirror will reflect the sun rays to the iron tower. This iron tower will transfer the heat into the pipe, as you can see. This is the water pipe. Okay, we will have water and we will have the heat. But we need uh, one more uh, source, which is the thermoelectric heaters uh, for more heat so that we can steam this water. Or, yeah, faster. We can steam this water faster. So, um, after heating uh, this water and having the steam, we will have the steam passing through this small hole and the thermoelectric heaters will generate energy will generate uh, heat energy as you can see it's a thermoelectric uh, heater so it will generate energy and uh, this energy will be stored okay so we have one um let's say tank of energy stored the gas will pass through the small hole and will go to the other let's say yeah uh, the other room which has the turbines the turbines will utilize uh, the gas and uh, convert it uh, to convert the gas itself to rotational energy. This rotational energy will be stored as well. So, two tanks of uh, stored energy. After utilizing uh, this gas, the thermoelectric coolers will um, thermoelectric coolers will intensify the steam water, and uh, we will have water. Water moving through the through the water pipe, as you can see. So this is the water pipe, and the, uh, after intensifying the water, uh, the steamed water, the water will move. Okay. As you can see, there is no inclination. The uh, pipes are not inclined, but we need them to be inclined because the gravity will not help us, since the gravity is not like the gravity on Earth. So uh, they will be inclined but there will be pressure, so the water will be able to move easily. So, the water will move to the water bump, and after reaching the water bump, it will be bumped upward. And that's it. What do we have now? We have a water cycle. So, uh, we have a water cycle, and uh, the water will be steamed again. So now we have three uh, tanks where the energy is stored from the 
thermoelectric heaters and the turbines and the thermoelectric coolers. What we will use this energy, this um, great energy for? We will use it for the chambers and other things. But let's uh, talk about the, ta uh, the chambers with Rawan. Thank you, Mariam and Maria. So basically, to summarize uh, what Mariam and Mariam said, we are using uh, what's there in the moon uh, to create energy. These energies, are uh, we're using them to uh, study uh, and experiment some, uh, uh, some experiment on the moon, some medical experiment on the moon. So my experiment on the moon surface basically is using microgravity of the moon uh, to create nano or micro capsules uh, that contains nanoparticles, for example, gold and gelatin. They bind to sulfur atoms and create capsules that target specific uh, cells and kill them. Uh, nanoparticles have antibodies attached to their body, help to bind only to tumor cells uh, and not healthy cells. We can take these microcapsules and then uh, with us back to Kuwait and sell them. Uh, and by telemedicine, and we can communicate with other facilities in other countries uh, to use this study. In the future, we can uh, use the nanoparticles for cleaning water by breaking down uh, organic uh, contaminants and, and by using it uh, for solar cells that uh, absorbs more sunlight and uh, uh, we can do much more with it. So uh, nanoparticles is the future for uh, uh, medicine and technology. Uh, and that's all, if you have any questions. Any questions? Does anyone have questions? First, the audience. Yes. By the way, uh, if I may, we have one of the judges sitting there. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Bassam. Okay. He is oh, supposed to be yeah. here, but he was outside of Kuwait. So at last we ca caught him. You guys use the secret word that he knows. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Any questions? Can you go to the diagram, please? Yeah. Yes. This is a question. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, so you have now a cycle, okay? Yeah. And I see here you have uh, some kind of light reflected so that you uh, will concentrate the heat, yeah. okay? And this is the way you are going to produce energy, okay? Why do you need the heat, okay? Uh, especially for the medical, for example, and yes. then, yes. There is a chamber here uh, mm -hmm. in this area we are using the thermal for uh, the endothermal uh, particles, like uh, the, go, uh, the uh, gelatin. It absorbs water, and, and then we use it uh, to create the micro uh, capsules. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need the heat. But the steam, uh, the heat is used for steaming, steaming the water itself. The water added, but we will add the water one time, since it's a water cycle. So, so. why why did you use water? We used water because it's rich with. Um, uh, it's rich with the minerals, mm -hmm. but we won't uh, use the sea salt since um, the salt won't be. Uh, the salt will, will damage the, uh, the pipes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. right. So, just to clarify, it's actually two parts to the project. The first one is how to generate energy on the surface of the moon using the resources available. Yes. And the end point of the output of that is to actually to develop the nano. Yeah, uh, we specified that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's actually two parts. We, we two parts, yes. All right. Another question for yes. Nick. So, I mean, why are you uh, generating your nanoparticles on the moon and not on the Earth? Because of the microgravity. We can uh, use the microgravity in, in targeting specific cells that cannot be used in, in, on Earth. It can only be done on, uh, on the surface of the moon because of the gravity. Someone's 
So, anything else? Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to say something. I told you yesterday that I came here to win. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, honestly, after leaving, I was driving and I, I was just thinking, it was an amazing experience, really, um, meeting these people, meeting you um, instructors. It was so awesome. So Absolutely. thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for joining me. Thank you much, Power. And now that all teams have delivered their ideas, we are going to take a 20 minutes break. Or should we say 30 minutes break is more appropriate. <laughs> yeah, for you to freshen up and for on honorable judges to have time to calculate the marks and announce the winners. So we are going to resume at 9 p.m. So thank you so much. Okay, uh, one second. Yeah, go, you know, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just uh, one last thing. First, thank you, Hanim and Lama and uh, KFAS, okay, for this opportunity and distinguished uh, guests. Okay, we learned a lot from you guys, three of you. Okay, amazing stuff. Okay, and the most important thing. Okay, uh, uh, and we are honored to be here. Okay, uh, the most important thing for me and I think for. My brother, okay, Abdul Wahab. By the way, his name is Abdul Wahab. My father's name is Abdul Wahab. Great grandfather's name is Abdul Wahab, and my son's name is Abdul Wahab. So <laughs> he's yeah, Abdul. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. But uh, one thing to emphasize: what you all delivered is amazing, really. Okay, I'm just saying that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Hala knows me. I go directly to the point, <laughs> not uh, and seriously. And for me and Abdul Wahab, all of you are winners. Yes. We are ready to announce. So, yes. yeah. Okay. As we are about to start, all guests are invited to come inside and take their seats. Let us welcome Laman Ghanem Latebi, who will be announcing the winner, and he will also be handing out certificates and um, trophies. But first, we would like to honor our special contributors who have showed great support. Okay, so first, our guests who have traveled a long way just to be here. It was a pleasure to meet you guys. You made these two days incredible. Uh, John Mankins, please. Mr. Oleg Vanskwai, please come. Mr. Shaitanya Gopal. And of course, how can I forget <laughs> Dr. Leila al Musawi? Our honorable judges, Mr. Abdelaziz Larayev and Mr. Abdul Wahab Zaydan. We just want to say this to the participants. When we first joined this uh, uh, event, we didn't know what to expect. And when we uh, were asked to judge uh, uh, your activities, 
we were concerned about two parts. That's involvement and teamwork. And when uh, the, 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 the panel uh, decided to mix you up, we, we thought this is going to be the most challenging part to score you. But the surprising thing is that all of you got the highest score in this year. You were very involved, and you all worked as a teamwork that knew each other for many years. And this actually makes us very proud. So we are very happy to uh, announce that you got the highest mark in these two areas. So thank you. One more thing. For us, all of you are winners, and it's like very hard to decide A, B, C. All of you are A's. Thank you very much. Now for the moment, I would like to invite Mr. John to help us hand the Crystal Awards and certificate to uh, um, the winners. Oh, we will actually, we will first announce the, the uh, participants and the third, the third place. So please, let's, let's uh, start with that. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. That's, that's how it will go. First of all, we, we, have received <laughs> we have received a lot of applications. And among those applications, participants below 18 years old who are in high school, stu high school students. We didn't want uh, to reject them. And now, uh, I would like to start, to start with them for their participation. Um, I would like to call uh, uh, Aurad Desbari. So, we had three teams, and now we will start with the second place. So, I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, Professor Ulrich. The second place. The, the third. The third. The third. The third. Yeah, we will start with the third place. Oh. That makes good sense. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I was confused. So please, Victoria, can you please hand, hand for us, help us with the third place? <laughs> All right. I, okay. So the third place is Delila.
لما تجي معهم مثلا كذا غير التليفون يا اخر طاوله Thank you, Mr. John. And now we will announce the second winner. The second place of obviously now Ahmed Bollar, Rawan Shimani, Maryam Jamal, Maryam Duela. Maryam Duela. Thank you very much. In the end, this was, I mean, personally, this was a joyful experience, definitely. Um, it's, it's, it, it was a huge effort in the last two days. I am very happy to have uh, the participants participating with us. The quality of the presentations are great. I, I, partic I participated in different similar activities in the International Space University and Space Generation Advisory Council. Um, I think the quality of the presentations is not very far from those who are working in the space community. And this is uh, predicting a promising uh, future, of course. And this would never happen, of course, without the mentorship of our three guests, uh, Mr. John Mankins, Professor Oleg, and Mr. Shaitania, and without the sponsorship of uh, Kuwait Foundation of the Advancement of Science. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, so I think it's the same question. Yeah. I was going to say, can't we take a group photo? Group photo, yeah. yeah. Upstairs, yeah. Upstairs. Upstairs. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So we don't lose it. This is a great chance. Yeah. Okay, let's have a picture right. upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Please come with us. Yeah. <laughs>